And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jason Kleiman. I'm an applications engineer here at BiAmp. And today we are going to talk about acoustic echo cancellation. So we have quite a bit of stuff to go through and it, it's been a little challenging to fit all this into an hour. So I'll do the best that I can. So I may have to go through a few of these concepts really fairly quickly and uh, try to leave some time at the end to maybe answer some questions, I hope. So uh, this is what we're gonna go through today. We're gonna briefly touch on a few of these and some of them we're gonna go into some significant depth. We're gonna try to do a little bit of a demonstration for you as well. I'd like to, uh, I'd like for you to hear a few things. I've got some demo equipment set up and it's gonna be something different. Uh, I haven't done this before with a, with a webcast, so we'll see how this works. We're gonna give it a shot. So appreciate some feedback on that, see if it was beneficial or not when we're done. So a few things I don't wanna talk about today. We're not gonna go into great depth on room design and acoustics and exactly how to set gain structure. Somebody's saying my mic isn't very good. Hold on a minute here. even looks like it's clipping for some reason on my headset. I do apologize for that. So bear with me just a second while I try to get that fixed. And I'm not having much luck. Hold on a second. Let me switch over to this and see if this works better. Can you hear me on this microphone? Okay, uh, let's try this. This is a little uh, desktop microphone setting here, which I'm going to use for our demo. So I will. Oh, sorry. Hold on just a second. Sorry, I've got to arrange all these windows on my screen so um, so we can do this. Okay, so the. Um, Something I don't want to go through today is the uh, details on conference room design and acoustics and all that kind of stuff, but we, that is important. We had a, a webinar last month, a gentleman named Brent Bowman. He's a member of our team. He's also another applications engineer. He did this part one for designing a conference room, and that's now available for viewing on our YouTube channel. So if you go to our YouTube channel, please check that out. And in January, we're doing part two, and he's going to go into some more depth of acoustics, DSP design, and gain structure, and all of that. So we're not going to be able to go through that here. It's, it's kind of a struggle to fit everything I want to talk about here in, uh, in just an hour, to be honest. Um, we're not going through DSP filter design. If that's what you're looking for, I am not the guy to ask about that. Um, this is not what we're talking about today. So, And then I'm also assuming that everybody has some general Tessera knowledge, and we're not going to go into details of how Tessera software works and how you do things specifically in Tessera, other than the things that relate directly to AEC. And uh, if I didn't mention that before, acoustic echo cancellation, we refer to that as AEC because it's much faster to say. So without further ado, let's jump into, into this. So we have a few things we have to look at here outside of our DSP design. And number one is microphone choice and speaker placement and microphone placement. So we have a lot of options available and you really have to pick what's gonna work best for your room and maximize that signal to noise ratio. So we have a lot of choices when it comes to microphones. You can go with ceiling microphones using gooseneck or pendant microphones, uh, like our little CM1 microphones here that are a cardioid and super cardioid pattern. A lot of people like to use a little tri-element microphones that, that hang from the ceiling. You have your DSP arrays, like our TCM1, which is a beam tracking microphone. The Shure, the Shure MXA910 is pretty popular. A lot of people like to use that. And then you have tabletop options. You have boundary microphones or gooseneck options, and even some wireless options that you can use for tabletop microphones. And typically a tabletop microphone is gonna get the microphone closer to the person talking. And when that helps, or when that happens, you have a much better signal to noise ratio. So you need to be, be aware of the acoustics of the room and choose and place microphones appropriately. We also have lavalier head worn headset microphones and handheld wired or wireless microphones. And those are usually used for local reinforcement in the room and also to send to the far end. So in big red letters, gain structure is critical. 
Uh, we don't have time to go in and talk about exactly how to set up gain structure and that. That's a whole topic on its, its own. But if you go to our support site at support.biamp.com, do a little search for gain structure or Tessera AEC. We have some really good articles that will guide you through the details of that and give you all the information you need. But right here, I have to stress that you have to have the gain structure set because the the gain structure is absolutely critical to get the AEC processing to work. And it's the same with auto mixers and all that kind of stuff. So let's keep going here. Uh, room acoustics, also very important. I don't have time to show you this video, but I do encourage you to take a look at this. If you go to YouTube, do a search for this little phrase here. If you download the handout for this class, you should get the slide and these links should work. But this is a YouTube video of a, a guy made to show what's going on with acoustical treatment. So it's, it's kind of crude, very simple, but he's in a room, very reverberant room, and he's beating on a snare drum. And then he slowly adds more and more acoustic material to treat that room. And what you hear, the difference that you hear is very obvious. And it's, it's very eye-opening and to listen to that. It's also a good thing you might be able to, to show customers, too, on exactly how room treatment impacts a room and why we need it. We also have some sample recordings available on Cornerstone as well with our TCM1 calculator. It's basically just recordings of different microphone to talker distances in different, different samplings of rooms. It's good to listen to that to kind of train your ears to get used to what you're listening to. So things that are important with acoustics, which we don't have time to go into any great detail, but a few of the high points here, rooms that yield poor intelligibility when you're standing in them trying to talk to somebody in the same room, they're going to be a terrible conferencing room. You're going to have poor intelligibility. You're going to have AEC problems. So we can't emphasize enough that good room acoustics make the difference. You want an RT60 of less than half a second and an ambient noise floor that's pretty low, around 35 to 40 dB. But if you think about it, if you have a high ambient noise level in the room, some HVAC or some big building vibration or something that's making a lot of noise, and your noise floor is 55 dB or so, and you've got a ceiling microphone, and that microphone is located you know, 6 to 10 feet away from the person talking, there's a good chance that your noise level may be the same level as the person talking by the time it gets to the microphone. So noise level is very important. And you need to measure that, too. Make sure you use the tools that we have to measure that, because if you just judge your ears on noise levels, um, they're not very accurate because we're less sensitive to things at lower frequencies, and usually the noise levels that cause the problems are those at the lower frequencies. So you need to go in and measure that. Plus, we get used to it. As we, we hear the noise, we just get accustomed to it and kind of tune it out. So it, it's important to, to know that you need to solve problems that exist in the physical world in the physical world. So if you have acoustic problems, you need to look at the room and deal with those in the physical world, not expect everything to happen in the DSP. We can do great things in DSP, but we can't defy the laws of physics, at least not yet, maybe someday, but we're hoping for that. But right now, we can take maybe the impact that these poor adverse conditions are causing and maybe lessen their impact somewhat, but we can't, we can't correct it. So if you have bad room reflections, high noise levels, you need to correct those in, in the physical world and educate people that this is really a serious and it's, it's a real problem that this is an entire system design that includes the room. It's not just a piece of electronics. So moving right along, what is AEC and why do we need it? So on the left hand side, we have somebody talking on the phone and we're going to refer to that as the far end. So the far end is the person that you're talking to outside of your room. And then the near end or the room is going to be over here on the right. And we have a lady here and she's got a little tabletop microphone. So she talks to the guy on the far end. She's going to speak into this microphone and he's going to hear it coming out of his cell phone on, the, on this side. And when he talks, it's going to show up at this speaker and be broadcast in the room. Now, this microphone doesn't know the difference between what's coming out of the speaker and this person talking. It just picks all of that up indiscriminately to it. It's just sound pressure waves. And it's transmitting that right back to this guy on the far end. So he talks, he comes out of the speaker, it gets picked up by the microphone, and he hears it, and it's going to be delayed. It's going to be delayed for whatever the latency time is in the phone system for that particular call at that particular moment, which it could be, you know, a couple hundred milliseconds. It could even be longer if you've got a bad connection. 
So he's hearing himself come back. He's hearing what he just said slightly after he said it. So it makes it very difficult to, to keep your sentence going if you're listening to yourself. So what we have next is with the AEC, uh, I just saw somebody said they're not hearing me. I'm getting mixed reviews. I, some people said they could hear me just fine, and somebody else said they couldn't. Is, are you hearing me right now? If somebody could throw that in. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Um, so we've got everybody's hearing me. That's good. Um, somebody does have an audio problem. may be on your end. Uh, so anyway, keep going here. What we're doing with AEC processing is we want to take that signal out. So if this guy's talking and it comes out of the speaker, gets picked up by the microphone, it's AEC's job to figure out what that signal is and filter it out. Then once it filters it out, it needs to do that without impacting the signal that you want to hear, which would be the person talking. So that's what AEC does. It's filtering out this room echo from the speaker back to the microphone that you would hear on the far end. So in order to do that, we need to tell it what to look for. And that's what our AEC reference is, which we're going to go into some great detail on what the AEC reference is. But we want to tell the AEC, give them a reference signal, and say, look for this type of signal showing up in this complex signal that you're going, uh, that's coming into you, passing through the, the card, and filter that out. So that's what we're doing with AEC. So why do we need it? Well, we want full duplex conversations. We want to interact over distances through a conferencing system like we interact with people in the same room. We want to be able to talk to each other, um, interact in the middle of the conversation, maybe throw something in, ask for clarification, uh, throw in some feedback, um, tell somebody they're wrong. We need to do all of that to, to communicate effectively. Well, with half duplex, if you think about a push to talk button on a walkie talkie, one person holds the button down and talks. The other person has to listen. They can't say anything until that person releases the button, and you can push the button down on the other end and say something. So you could hold the button down, and you're talking, and then suddenly you finish, you release the button, and the other person chimes in and says, well, everything you said for the last 15 minutes is completely wrong. So it, it makes it very difficult to communicate if you're trying to do full duplex. You want both sides to be able to jump in and out and speak basically at the same time like we're in the same room. AEC allows us to do that. It's also impossible for the person on the far end of the call to effectively communicate if they constantly hear what they just said come back into their ear. It's, just, it's very distracting, and AEC fixes that for us as well. Important to know that AEC benefits the person on the other side of the call. It doesn't help the people in the room. That's what it was designed for. We're getting rid of that acoustic echo to the far end. We're not doing anything in the room to, like, get around room acoustics or any reverberation in the room or anything like that. This is strictly to benefit the people on the far end. Uh, the people in the room really don't even know that AEC is working or not, with the exception that it allows them to effectively communicate to the people on the other end. So what do we need to do this in Tessera? We're going to uh, blow through some of the hardware stuff here fairly quickly so we can get to, to the, the good stuff. But in a nutshell, we have two different types of hardware in Tessera. We have our server, server I.O. chassis, and then we have our Tessera Fortes. And in between that, we have our expanders as well. So in the, the server and the expanders, the XMOD or the XAEC, we have one type of AEC hardware. And this is the SEC4 card. It's a four-channel card. We have a slightly different model number that fix in, fix, uh, sorry, I can't talk, fits in our XMOD expander and then it's, it's integrated into the XAEC expander as well. So this is four channels of AEC processing, and this processing happens at the input. So each channel is doing its own AEC processing, and this is with dedicated DSP hardware on this input card. So you're not tying up any of your core DSP with AEC. And for this particular type of hardware, we have a tail length of 300 milliseconds, which kind of keep that in your mind. We'll talk more about what that tail length means a little bit later. On the Forte side of things, we have AEC available in 
everything except the AI. So all the different flavors of Forte, the VT, the VT4, the VI, the TI, and the CI will have AEC processing in them. And 12 channels for everything except the VT4, since it only has four input channels, of course, it only has four, four channels of AEC as well. But the Forte is a little bit lower in horsepower when it comes to DSP. So the, the hardware that we have on there allows us to only have a tail length of up to 250 milliseconds. So most situations that difference really doesn't matter, but if you get in really challenging acoustical environments, you may have better performance out of the, uh, the server or expander hardware than you will out of the Forte. But again, if you have a room that's it's a, a well-designed room and it's nice and quiet, you'll never notice a difference. So what exactly are we doing with AEC? Well, we have a signal that shows up in the room and then we look at that signal on the input. And what we have to do is we have to create a filter to filter that signal out, basically, is what we're looking for. So what, we sh what shows up at the reference, we create a filter that should be essentially the inverse of the, the original signal. And if we take the inverse and mix that together with the original signal, we basically cancel it out. You can do that experiment with, with a sine wave. If you take a, a, a sine wave generator and have two sine waves that are the same frequency and same level and mix them together, but one is flipped 180 degrees out of phase or reverse the polarity, and it's going to cancel, it's going to cancel it out. And with a sine wave like that, it does it very well. I mean, it really gets rid of it. And we're doing that with AEC with complex sources like speech. I mean, speech is changing constantly in time, and we have to create a way to filter that, that time variant signal out of this bigger, complicated signal. So the AEC reference I mentioned earlier, this is something that's very, very important which is why we're going to talk a lot about how you get to the reference. But the reference is the signal that you're telling the AEC to filter out. So this is what we want to, this is our, re, well, uh, it's a reference. So, but we have to tell the AEC processing what we want it to look for and filter out. So that leads us to this. This is an overall block diagram of kind of what we're doing with, with AEC. So here we have a speaker and the speaker is, you know, projecting energy into the room. This is going to be your far end source usually. It could be your program sources as well. But coming out of the speaker, you have some direct sound that shows up at the microphone in the room. Whether it's a table microphone, a ceiling microphone, it's going to show up. And it's going to also pick up all these reflections that are bouncing around. So it picks all of that up in addition to what you want it to pick up, which is the person in the room talking into the microphone. That's who you want to hear. You don't want to hear this coming out of the speaker going back to the far end. You only want to hear this person talking. But these signals are mixed together acoustically and show up at this microphone, and then that shows up at our input. So we start off by running that through a high-pass filter. And then after the high-pass filter, we run it through our adaptive filter, which is kind of what I showed you before, which is that inverted filter, and it's going to filter out whatever I send to this AEC reference. So the adaptive filter is created based on what I'm sending to the AEC reference and based on what it sees coming in at this input. And then we apply that filter and that's what takes, takes that echo out. And we constantly look at that. We're looking at what's left over after we've processed that to improve. So we're going to constantly move that filter around, adjust that filter, based on how much residual echo we have to get it to function as best as it can. And we also change. We have to change that as the signal changes or as conditions in the room change, as somebody may move a microphone, something like that. Anything that changes the echo path here that's showing up on this microphone means this filter is going to have to do something to catch up with that. We call that catching up convergence, or we, we say it takes time for something to, for AC to converge and that's what we mean when we say that. It's, it's adapting and it's learning what it needs to do and what signal it needs to lock on and, and pull out. And this adaptive filter does a great job, but we still have some residual echo left over. So the adaptive filter realistically gets rid of about 20 to 30 dB of that signal, and then everything else 
is removed down here in this next section, which is called NLP, or nonlinear processing. So through here, we try to pull out the rest of that echo. And we have some goals of you know what, how much echo reduction do we really want the system to have, and then whatever's left over, the NLP tries to meet that goal. So adaptive filter plus NLP is our AEC. And the adaptive filters work a little different than NLP. And we'll touch on that shortly. But after that, we also run through some noise reduction to filter out HVAC noise and all that kind of stuff. I see a question up here. How fast does the adaptive filter adjust? Um, it adapts, it converges at about 100 dB per second. So um, it, it's really fast, and exactly how long it takes to catch back up to, to the echo, it, it really depends on the situation. I mean, it's going to converge very quickly, but um, it doesn't necessarily have a specific time that it, it's guaranteed that it's going to lock on. After we go through the noise reduction, we go through an AGC algorithm, which the AGC, we're not going to go through in any detail here, but AGC is basically, if you think about it, your quiet talkers need to be turned up a little bit, your loud talkers need to be turned down a little bit. That's what AGC does, and it has targets that you can program, and it will only operate with speech. And, uh, sorry, I got a little distracted here. Um, it mimics a person sitting in a mixing console, turning a quiet person up and turning a loud person down. That's really what AGC does. So then at the end of all this, you end up with uh, a signal coming through without any echo. So when we talk about tail length, we're talking about all these reflections that are bouncing around because we have direct sound that comes from the loudspeaker into the microphone. But then we have all of these reflections coming from all over the place in the room that then show up at the microphone much later. So the adaptive filter is going to work on some of that and NLP is going to get rid of the rest. But we have a tail of an echo as those reflections reach it and die down. You end up with like a little decay time of the room. And you can measure that as the RT60 of the room. But you want to minimize these reflections. Uh, you know, a couple of good, strong reflections showing back up at the microphone are not going to cause any problems. But when you get into 15 or more strong reflections showing up at the microphone, it definitely has an impact. Because if you think about what the processing is doing, it has to lock on to all of those and try to create filters to pull all of that information out. So the more stuff you have, the harder it has to work. And the more chances you run into of having some sort of an artifact show up on that. So the adaptive filter handles the early echoes. And that's going to be in that 250 or 300 millisecond time window. And the adaptive filter functions during double talk as well. So it's going to work just as well if you have one person talking as it does if you have two people talking. The NLP is going to handle your later echoes, and it's going to pull out that residual echo that the adaptive filter couldn't get rid of. And NLP does impact your double talk, because what NLP sometimes has to do is adjust the level of what's coming from the near end to turn it down a little bit to get rid of the rest of that echo. So that's going to impact your double talk, and how much it impacts depends on the mode you set. So you can set it to none, low, medium, or high, and you want to set this level based on what the RT60 of the room is. And as you go up, the NLP is going to get more aggressive. So if you put it on high, you're going to lose the really good ability to do double talk as opposed to on low. But like I mentioned before, we want a conference room with an RT60 of less than half a second, which is going to be less than 600 milliseconds. So realistically, well, not realistically, ideally, we would be able to always use low. But I know in the real world, that's not always the case. So we need to use some higher levels. But just understand, as you go up, it gets more aggressive, and you may hear more things happen. So how do you do this in Tessera? The blocks you put in Tessera would be your input blocks that have AEC. So we have a specific block that says AEC. And when you drop those in, you're going to get a reference as well. So you have an initialization option here to pick this reference. So since the processing is done on the card, 
and we need a reference to use AEC. It just we have to have a reference signal for each individual channel on the AEC processing. But when we put out a single channel reference, we're essentially saying, hey, whatever shows up here is going to be used at all four channels on this block, or however many channels you have on the block. So that's what a single channel reference does. On the other end of the spectrum, we have a multi-channel reference. And the multi-channel reference means that you have the option to pick and choose different signals for each individual microphone as a reference. And we'll hit on why we need to do that shortly. Then we have a single channel with pass-through mode, which means it basically just the input of the reference goes to the output of the reference. And there are some use cases where you need to do that. But an important thing to remember is make sure this output is terminated. If you don't, it doesn't compile well and you get all sorts of errors. You'll see other blocks that don't compile. But this used to be the default and caused us some grief, so we've changed it to this as the default so we don't have that problem anymore. But just remember if you use this, make sure you terminate it. So we have an option to say whether or not we want to include the analog input block that's associated with this AEC. If you uncheck that, it's not going to put the input block here. So you aren't using the analog inputs on that card. But you still get the processing block in the AEC reference. If you don't need that later, you can, or you can add it later. But if you drop it in with the input block, you can also drop it off and just delete it without impacting these two. And why would you need that? Well, you may not be using inputs from those analog inputs. You may not need those analog inputs on the card at all because you're bringing your microphone in through like a TCM1, coming in through AVB, maybe another microphone that's coming in over explicit AVB. Uh, Dante inputs, your Shures will come in over Dante. And I don't know of any Cobernet mics out there right now that we run into, but we run into Dante and AVB quite a bit. Well, since our processing is actually done on the card itself, we need a way to route that back through that DSP. That's why we have separate blocks for everything. So what you're doing here with this TCM1, you're really taking the AVB network audio in, routing it through that DSP associated with these four channels, and then back to the core DSP here so we can use it. So then what happens to those inputs associated with this block? Well, they're available for use, so you don't lose them. So if you have an AEC card in this configuration where you have AEC processing here with an AVB microphone, you can then use those four inputs as regular program inputs. So essentially you're coming off of the analog input directly into the core DSP, not going through this, not going through the AEC. And then you're bringing something else in to the AEC processing and then back out. And you can do that with microphones coming in over the audio network or other inputs, like maybe an expander that you have that you need AEC on, but you have free AEC channels on the, on the server or the Forte. You could use a regular analog input for that. So the AEC reference basically means anything we route to this block is what we're going to look at in this block to cancel out. They're separate blocks for to, be, to allow you to make nice, clean DSP layouts. So basically, these are tied together internally. They are one and the same. So they communicate with each other. You can always tell which one is associated, or which reference is associated to which AC block by this little number in this white box here. So this one says one, this one says one. So you can identify the reference that goes with that. But we do that because Input stuff is on the left-hand side of our files. Output stuff is on the right-hand side of our files. So that's why we have two separate blocks for that. So what we're doing is routing something to the AC reference, and then conceptually the AC reference then is telling your input processing what it needs to find. So we route something from the far end out to the speaker through the reference. The reference talks to the AC processing on the input, it looks for that signal, and then once it gets to the input, we identify that, and we blow it up in a big ball of fire like that. I love that animation. So what do we route to the reference? Basically, anything we don't want to show up on the far end that's coming out of the speakers in the room. It comes out of the speaker in the room, gets picked up by the microphone, goes out to the far end. Anything that we want to not do that, 
that's what we need to route to the reference. So what would that be? That's going to be your your far end signal. So anything coming in off your phone, if you're using a soft codec, it's going to be your USB input. Uh, if you've got a line input coming in from an external codec, you're going to need to route that to your reference as well. But in addition to that, any program sources that are showing up at the speakers in the room, you want to route there as well. Because Internally, you want a laptop presentation audio to go directly to the far end. You don't want to hear a microphone picking up that audio with, from the speaker in the room. It, just, it sounds roomy. It sounds terrible. So we want to route that direct. And if you route that direct, it's still going to pick up that signal coming back at the microphone. So we route it to the reference to get rid of it. So the far end, here's a nice, clean presentation audio. So when do we want to use a multi-channel reference? Well, a multi-channel reference typically gets used in two scenarios. One is if you have inputs split across different spaces. So if you have a Forte which has 12 inputs, and let's say you have six in room A and six in room B, they're different spaces, so you're going to need different references, so you'll want to use a multi-channel reference. And another situation is if you have a microphone reinforced in the room. If you have one of those handheld or lavalier microphones, you're using that for local sound reinforcement, you want to route that to the references for your table or ceiling microphones so that audio gets pulled out of there. But you never want to route a microphone to its own reference. If you route a microphone to its own reference, then it's going to try to cancel itself out of the input where you want it to pass through. So that's a very bad thing. And that's a common problem. So if you have locally reinforced microphones, then you need to to use the multi-channel reference. So let's switch over here to a quick little demonstration that I have of, of a file using a multi-channel reference. So a very simple example file here, I have two handheld microphones and four table microphones. And I have a couple of program inputs and then two far in here, uh, VoIP receive, and then something coming in off of the soft codec on a computer through USB. So to my ceiling speakers, I have all my program sources my far ends, and my two handheld microphones. That's all going to show up coming out of the ceiling speakers. My table microphones are only going to the far end along with the handheld and the program sources. So if I talk into a handheld microphone, it's going to show up at the ceiling speakers. It's going to come out of the speakers, show up back at the table microphones, get picked up by the table microphones, and then get shoved down here to the far end unless we run it through AEC to filter that out. So to make this work, we want to route the handheld microphones to the ceiling microphone reference. Sorry, I keep saying ceiling microphones, it's table microphones on here. So we have table microphones, four individual reference points for these table microphones, and that needs to include your far end stuff, your program stuff, and the two microphones that are sitting here coming out of the speakers in the room. That's what's going to go to the table reference. To the handheld microphone reference, we really only need the far end sources. Now, there, there are situations where you would need to route like handheld one to handheld two, handheld two to handheld one's reference. In most smaller room scenarios, that's usually not a problem and you don't, you don't notice that. So sometimes creating two separate submixes for your table mic or ceiling mic reference and your handheld reinforced mic reference is usually sufficient. And notice we don't need to do the opposite. We do not need to route table mics to handheld mic references because the table mics are not reinforced in the room. So moving on to show you a little bit about the AEC processing block and my live demo file. So I'm talking to you actually through this little system now. I have a little tabletop microphone that I'm using. I have a TCM1A sitting in the other room with an amplifier and a speaker on it. And it's going to do a little demo, and I'm going to let you hear. And then I have an XUBT, and I'm feeding back into my computer over USB, and that's how this audio is getting to you. I also have a delay in here, so when I simulate the, the echo problem, you're going to hear what it would sound like on the far end, so you can hear some delay coming through the telephone system. But on the AAC processing block, we can turn AAC on and off. That's with this button. You want to turn AEC off on channels that you don't need it on. So if you have program sources, just go in and turn AEC off on that. You can set your NLP level here, set your noise reduction here, 
and low, medium, high. Always start off at low on both and see how it works. If you, if you notice some definite improvement when you go from low to medium, then maybe you want medium. If you don't notice much of an improvement when you go up to medium, go back to low. But only use what you need because the higher you go, the more aggressive this processing gets. And then if you've got a lot of noise in the room and you put it on high, you usually end up hearing some artifacting because it's trying so hard to filter out all that noise that you hear a few results on that. This little button opens up the AC processing window and we'll cover all of these meters in my next slide, but you basically have four tabs here. This is where you want to go to see what's going on on that AEC channel and monitor its performance to see if it's working. We have two tabs related to AGC. We're not going into how AGC works in this webinar, but know that it's here and know that it's enabled by default. So if you don't want AGC, remember to go in here and bypass it if you don't need it. But the AGC defaults work really well on microphones that have where the gain structure has been set up properly. On the advanced filters tab, we have a high pass filters. We have a nice high pass filter in the AEC processing, which I definitely encourage you to use. If you're doing any high pass filtering, do it in the AEC processing, not, not out here. But if you don't need it, if you're not doing anything with it, you would want to come in here and bypass it. We have a setting over here to tell the block what the minimum noise floor that's coming in is. Um, you don't have to do anything with that. Sometimes we go in and we tweak that to just improve performance if we're having problems. So what do all of those meters actually mean? Well, meters one through five are signal levels at various points in this processing chain. So AC reference is going to be the signal level at the input of the reference. Two is the input of the adaptive filter. Three is the output of the adaptive filter. Four is after NLP and five is after the noise reduction. So you can use these as troubleshooting tools as well. And these are all RMS levels as well, which is different. We usually put peak meters out in the main DSP, but all of these are RMS. So know that there will be a slight level difference when you're looking, comparing between peak meters and what's in here. But since we're removing stuff in this filter, three should be less than two. If the far end's talking and the filter's working and it's pulling stuff out, that's what you should see. This level should be less than this level. And then if NLP is turned on, four should be less than three. If noise reduction is turned on, five would be less than four. So you should see that cascading effect through these meters when the far end is talking. This last one over here is the AGC amount. So it's going to tell you how much AGC boost or cut that the AGC processing is actually doing at the moment. Then these two, number six and seven, are your AEC performance indicators. ERL stands for echo return loss, and that's basically the difference between the signal that shows up here and that reference signal component that's showing up here. So this, not what's coming out of the person talking. So we're comparing the same signal in two different places. That's gonna be after we've filtered it out. And you want that level usually to be between plus five and plus 10. You, know, you can go plus zero to plus 15 and still be okay, but the perfect ideal world is you adjust everything so you can get to plus five to plus 10. And if you go through and set up your gain structure correctly, that's usually where you end up. This last one, ERLE, stands for Echo Return Loss Enhancement. This is the actual amount of reduction that the adaptive filter is performing at that particular time. So as the far end talks, you should watch this meter and it should go up. And I mentioned that 20 to 30 dB of filtering that you're gonna get with the adaptive filter, you should see this go up to that range if it's working correctly. I saw a question, yeah, I know I'm going really, really fast on this, I'm sorry. There's just a lot of stuff to cover in a very short period of time. But yes, there will be a recording. You'll get a link to the recording of this later. And this will also be on our YouTube video or our YouTube channel in just a few weeks. So I want to switch over to a little, switch over to a little bit of a demonstration here. And I have to turn something else on just a second. Okay, so now you're hearing me, well, you've been listening to me all the time. This is direct through a microphone through this little demo system. What I want to do now is switch over to a preset so you can hear me coming out of this speaker in the room. 
So you should notice a distinct difference in the way this sounds when I swap over to this. Okay, so this is me talking through the microphone here at my desk. Let's turn the signal path identifier on. Going to the speaker in the room, picked up by the TCM1, and it's getting routed out to you. So that should sound noticeably different than what you're hearing right now, which is the microphone coming to you direct. So I wanted you to hear what that roomy sound is like. And this is a really quiet room as well. There's, there's very little reverberation or reflection in there. And uh, it's probably not, not the ideal setup. I'm trying to do some demo here. So I've got the speaker is relatively close to the microphone. So now I'm gonna turn this on with AEC working. And you notice no difference because AEC is working. As soon as I break it, now, now you should hear, you the, should echo. hear the echo. So let's turn it back on and describe a little bit of what I just did. Right now my microphone is routed to the reference. When I click this preset, my microphone, My microphone no longer, no goes, longer to the goes to the reference. reference. And what you're hearing is what the far end or would hear. So if you're talking on a phone, you'd hear yourself and then you'd hear yourself delayed. And that's what it sounds like when AEC is not working. So let's show the meters. And you'll see right now that the ERL level is in that between plus five and plus 10 range, which is where I want it to be. And we're getting, you know, in the 20s, 30s, 30 dB, almost 40 in some cases of ERLE. So this is telling me right now how much echo is being pulled out. And if I go in here and artificially adjust the level I'm going to the AEC reference, essentially to make it perform worse, you're gonna hear some echo kick in. So it's gonna to start to echo as I turn this down and you'll hear some stuff and then actually it might, it might eventually, eventually catch, catch up. up. No, I went no, too, I went low. too low. But uh, test one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So here I've actually really poorly balanced the signal level and the echo is actually actually gone. But you can see that meter change and now I have a range. It's in the minus something, almost minus 30. It's off the bottom of the meter. Then as I bring this back up, go back straight to zero, we're back to where we want to be. So as you can tell, even with it in the negative, in this particular room, this, this AEC was actually keeping up with it. Okay, let's flip back over to my direct and well, let's just do this one more, one time, more time so you get so an you idea, get an idea of how, how hard it is to actually communicate if you're hearing that. So I hope that demonstrated, you know, how bad it is that we need AEC in a conferencing system, which probably all of you knew. But one other thing I want to show you is what happens when you route a microphone to its own reference, which we never want to do, because if we tell the AEC processing to cancel out the microphone we're trying to use, that's eh, naturally a bad thing. So if you listen now, as I do this, it should sound really, really weird. So hopefully everybody's hearing that, but can still somewhat understand me. So I'm gonna switch back to the direct. This is, people describe this as an underwater sound or garbled sound. And that's usually indicative that you have a microphone getting into its own reference. So let's just do this real quick so you can hear this one more time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So that's, that's what it sounds like when you route a microphone to its own reference. So let's flip back over here. I hope that was beneficial to hear some of that for you. Uh, if you could let me know in the feedback afterwards whether it was worth it or not to hear that. But let's talk a little bit about AC tuning. The first place to start is always setting your gain structure. Hold on, I have to turn something else off. There we go. I was actually listening to myself so I could hear what was going out and that was kind of getting annoying uh, in my headset. So turn that off. And 
when you set your gain structure, you want to look at trying to have things through the DSP as close to Unity as possible and adjust your input level. So you're going to adjust your microphone input level so you've got levels that are peaking above zero on the peak meters. If you've got an RMS meter in there, you want normal speech to be around zero. So you're going to sit down at the table and have a normal person talk and set that level so it's peaking above zero. I mean, ideally with speech, you'd want to see that maybe peaks hitting uh, between plus six and plus 10 dB. If you put an RMS meter, you should see that hovering right around zero. And that usually gets you where you want to be. And once you have that set, then go in and adjust your output levels, get your program sources through and find out what level you want those to be at. But it's very important that you start with these microphone input gains. Everything functions around that. So please also go, go check the, uh, the stuff that we do have on Cornerstone on that if you want to get into some details on gain structure. I know I'm going to preach set gain structure, set gain structure, but I can't go into a lot of detail on exactly how to do it in the time that we have. Okay, the ERL level is where you want to go to see if your AEC is working. Ideally, that ERL level is going to be between plus 5 and plus 10 dB. If it's not, is it still within 0 dB and plus 15 dB? As long as it's positive but not too excessive, chances are your AEC is going to be working pretty well. There are some situations where you can't get it within that plus 5 and plus 10 dB range, but we should always try try to do that. Um, levels on the peak meter between plus 6 and plus 10, I think speech has a crest factor of about 10. So if you have speech peaking at between plus 6 and plus 10 should equate out to be about 0 RMS. Hopefully that answers your question on that. Um, so we want to take a look at the ERL levels and see if we're getting that, getting that in an acceptable range. So what happens if it's too high, if it's uh, between plus 15 and plus 30? Well, it's probably not going to work very good. It means you have a big mismatch between what's showing up at the AEC reference and what's showing up at the AEC processing input. So you might hear some residual echo. The algorithm may not converge quickly or it may not be able to converge fully at all. It's usually indicative that you, you've got your mic input gain is, is too low, your amplifier gain may be too low. Basically there's a mismatch in your gain structure and it could be related to, to speaker placement as well. But ultimately your AC reference signal is too high is what this is telling you. So what do you do to fix that? Well, chances are it's a gain structure problem. So you need to start out and go back and look at your gain structure and fix your gain structure. That's the number one thing to do. And you're probably going to end up increasing your microphone gain or bumping your amp gain up to get it to that way. But ultimately that indicates that you've got a level mismatch somewhere through the system and you need to go back to the basics. You can artificially reduce the AEC reference going, uh, the signal going into the AEC reference to lower that ERL. It's artificially doing it. You're, you're kind of cheating when you do that. And it's okay to do that as a last resort when you're already pretty close. If you find that you go in and reduce it by 10 to 15 dB to get it down to where you want it to be, you're probably doing more harm than good and you need to go back to look at your gain structure. But, you know, if you're close, let's say you're at, you're at, you know, plus four on the ERL level meter, and you really want to get to that between plus five, plus 10, you, you can boost that by a few dB and get away with it and probably improve the performance some. But if you're going any more than that, larger jumps, you need to avoid that at all costs. So on the other end of the spectrum, what happens if it's too low, if it's below zero? Same deal, you're going to have poor performance. It's probably not going to be picking up on all the echo and you're going to hear some residual echo. Ultimately, same deal. It means you've got gain structure that is not correct. In this case, the AEC reference is actually too low. So it's a case where your input gain on your mics might actually be too high. So you may need to go back and look at that as well. Um, there's also the, the case where you can end up with speakers just being too loud. I mean, AEC is a great technology. It works wonderfully but it has limits like everything. So if you have a loud speaker shooting directly into a microphone, you're going to reach a point at some time where it may not be able to pull all of that out. 
So you have to be wary of, of good system design to make sure that's not the case. And again, to fix that problem, you need to, well, if it's a, uh, if it's a physical location problem, you need to look at your uh, placement for speakers and microphones. But if, we're, if we have a low level, we naturally want to go back and check our gain structure, start with the gain structure, and we may need to make some adjustments there. And we can increase the level artificially going into the AC reference if we need to by a small amount. So a few tips on commissioning, and we'll talk about a few common problems. Gain structure is key, so always start with the gain structure. A lot of the problems we run into and have phone calls on usually end up being related to gain structure. And I know in very complex systems, this is not always easy to go back and start from scratch and say, hey, I need to adjust all these gains to get the AEC working. So I always recommend start with that because if your AEC isn't performing correctly and it's related to gain structure, then you have to fix the gain structure. And that may mean that it throws some other things off and you have to readjust them. So I would always start with getting the AEC set up first because you're going to set your mic input gains and some of those intermediate gain controls to get the AEC functioning and you want to get those levels there. Then you can bring your program sources in and turn the inputs down on the program sources if you need to to get everything balanced. But definitely start with gain structure. Use auto mixers. If you have 15 microphones in a room, you definitely do not want all of them on at the same time. So an auto mixer allows you to limit the number of open microphones that you have, uh, have on at any given time. So auto mixers are a great tool. Make sure that the AEC reference routing is correct. You never route a microphone to its own reference. And you also don't want to have anything going to the microphone ref or to the AC reference that shouldn't be there. So if you have a cable box that's playing audio into the reference, but that's not coming out in the room, the AEC is looking for that. It's, it's still wasting cycles to try to find that, and it's working pretty hard, and it could cause it to not work as efficiently as it will if you only route the stuff to the reference that you want to take out. You also want to make sure that you only have one um, AEC running at a time. Your video codec probably has AEC in it. Uh, the soft codecs naturally in your computer will have AEC in it. Having two at the same time in the signal path really doesn't gain you anything, but it can cause some interaction problems. And you really want to use the AEC in the Tessera in this case because we're doing that per channel AEC, which is going to be more efficient than what's going on in a video codec, which is doing AEC processing on the entire mix. So to do that, it's probably using a lot more nonlinear processing, and you may end up to some problems. Um, question just popped up. I'll get to that shortly. So you also want to be concerned about a loopback in something like a video codec or an external AV router. This is where you get into what is direct echo and what is room echo. You need to use your ears and listen to that because some video codecs have inputs that get routed back around to its output. And if that output then comes back into the Tessera that's routed to the far end, you now have a direct path. And that direct path is going to sound like echo, but it's not room echo that you can fix with AEC. It's actually a routing problem. And you also want to be wary of where level controls are in the system. So if you're adjusting a program level in the room or your receive level in the room, you want to do that ahead of the matrix mixer. So it's also going to adjust that level up and down going to the AEC reference. So if you turn up whatever's coming out of the speakers, this, uh, that signal, that reference signal is also getting turned up by the same amount. That helps keep everything in balance. If you don't do that, it takes a little bit for the AEC to reconverge if you start messing with levels, but it will eventually kept, catch up. You also want to use that high pass filter. That high pass filter on the AEC processing, if you notice, is actually before we start getting into our adaptive filter, our NLP, and our noise reduction. So if you have a lot of low frequency rumble in the room, which tends to be a majority of what ends up being there, you can filter a lot of that out with a high pass filter. And you can use this high pass filter. It's going to get rid of it before the noise reduction tries to work. 
and it's going to make the noise reduction operate more efficiently, getting rid of only the noise that's left, and it's going to work better doing that. Typically, for most systems, I mean, starting good starting point for your high-pass filter is about 150 hertz. Uh, you can go high. If you have very poor rooms with really bad acoustics, you may need to go as high as 300 hertz. And that sounds extreme and aggressive, but if you go back to the analog telephone days, that was pretty close to the low end of an analog telephone. And sometimes you have to sacrifice maybe it, the quality of the audio to be intelligible. You need a much smaller bandwidth for intelligibility than you would for just some, you know, big radio sound type close microphone application. And if you have bad acoustics, you may have to make that sacrifice. But even with ceiling microphones, I usually find that you end up in the 200 hertz range just for ceiling microphones because you end up with a lot of low frequency energy in the room that you just need to get rid of that just muddies up the sound. So use this filter. Please remember it's there. It's a wonderful thing to use. Most common problems we run into are usually the result of bad gain structure. And number two on the list, of course, is bad acoustics. And sometimes one and two really go hand in hand. So those are the, those are the top two. So if you have bad acoustics, you need to really look at what needs to be done to correct that. Uh, we can work on some stuff. We can work on the stuff in DSP that may help that, but it's not going to fix the actual problem. It's really just a Band-Aid. Make sure you don't have a microphone routed to its own reference. It's always a no-no, which we've got a question on that, which we'll address here shortly. I'm going to try to get through the slides, and then we'll, uh, we'll go through some of these questions for those of you who still want to hang around. Uh, be mindful of that direct echo. If you have an AV router in there, you've got to watch out for that direct echo and make sure that's not there. Uh, sometimes you have the wrong stuff routed to the reference, or somebody will forget to route one particular thing to the reference. So we have the signal path identifier. Make sure you use that signal path identifier and make sure everything that needs to go to the reference is there. Unterminated AC reference for that one case, if you have the pass-through, make sure that's always there. That's a pretty common problem. And this one is, is an interesting one, an indirect path to the AC reference. What I mean by that is, let's say, for example, you have two microphones, microphone A and microphone B. And earlier I said, if you're reinforcing microphones in the room, you want to route them to other microphones' references. Well, if you do that, if you route A to B's reference and B to A's reference, but you're standing in between the microphones and both of them are picking you up at maybe close to the same level, what are you doing? You're essentially getting that signal in to its own reference indirectly. So you have to be careful of that, and that tends to be problematic if you have uh, mixed minus systems. So the way to get around that is you may have to break stuff up in, into a little bit larger zones to stop that from happening. And there usually end up being some trade-offs, but if you have that specific um, problem, give us a call and we'll help you work through that. Troubleshooting tips, use your ears. Um, identify that echo. That's the first thing you want to do. If you have an echo problem, you need to go in and take a look at what that echo is. Is it direct echo or is it room echo? Because if it's direct echo, you need to look one place, if it's room echo, you need to look somewhere else. So if it's room echo that you're hearing, then it's an AEC problem, and you need to go through that. Check your gain structure, check, uh, take a look at your meters, check your routing, look at all that kind of stuff if you identify it as being uh, room echo. If, if you identify it as being direct echo, then look at your routing to your external devices or just internal with your matrix mixer. It could be that you accidentally routed the VoIP receive back to the same VoIP transmit. It happens once in a while. But a big troubleshooting tip, and this is my path that I always go down, is isolate the problem. If you're hearing some echo, start taking things out, start isolating it, maybe just down to just the room microphones and the far end. So you've muted all your program sources, you've muted all feeds to all other devices, and see if you still have the echo. And if you're tuning, maybe just take it down to one particular, um, one particular microphone, listen to that, and start tuning there. And then if, if you get gets rid of the problem by turning things off, suddenly your echo is gone, then start turning things back on until the echo comes back, and that helps you, helps you where to look. So that basically comes to the end of the presentation. Um, 
We'll get to a few of these questions here in just a second, but thank you all for attending today if you need to drop off. Uh, if not, if you want to hear an answer, we've got three questions here I'd like to try to answer. Um, but please check out our support site, support.biamp.com. Do some searches on there for AEC uh, gain structure. You'll find a lot of information. Check out the other webinars that we have and some videos on our YouTube channels for some additional information. And you can always call us or email us at support at buyamp.com. If you have specific questions on this webinar, please, please email me directly. I'm happy to answer that. Um, the guys that uh, get the support account probably won't know the answer to what we talked about today because they didn't come to the webinar. So anyway, but if you have a, a technical problem and you're on site, um, please, please call us or email us to support at buyamp.com because you get a faster response. You're welcome to email me, but if I'm tied up or out of the office, it may take a little while for me to get back to you. Okay, so a few little questions here I'm going to go through, and thank you, everybody, if you need to drop off. Uh, the first question here, if you can't route a mic to its own reference, how do you cancel it out if it's being used for reinforcement? The answer is you're not going to cancel that microphone out of its own input. It's, it's a trade-off that you really just you have to live with. And in most voice lift applications, that microphone that's being reinforced in the room hopefully isn't coming out of a speaker very close to that microphone at a significant level to a point to where it may even make it back in. So by good system design, you should be hopefully doing a mix minus in that sort of situation. And whatever is making it back to that microphone is low enough that it's not going to end up creating noticeable echo on the far end. Uh, next question here was, so the high pass filter, the AEC block only affects the processing, not the actual. No, it does, it does affect what's coming to the output. Everything that runs through that chain, let me run back to that slide here just a second. Everything that runs through this chain does get impacted. So that high pass filter is going in here. It's going through all this stuff and the signal on the other end does get impacted by that high pass filter. Another question is, uh, presume you need to turn off AGC on voice lift microphones so you don't cause feedback. Um, the answer is maybe. Um, if you calibrate your voice lift in the room using the AGC, you can set limits on the AGC. The AGC has a maximum level. So you can get it to turn up to its maximum level. Let's say you're only allowing it to boost it by 6 dB. Then you would calibrate the system with it at 6 dB boost, and then you can allow it to back off from there. So if you get a chance, uh, Frank, go check out... Um, Go to support.biamp.com. Just do a quick search on AGC. We've got some stuff on there that tells you about that. Or feel free to email me a question about that if you want to talk about it further. Uh, last question. Uh, actually, maybe two questions here. How did you simulate the echo issue on your end, even though you were the originating source? Um, I mixed myself back in. Let me show you that really quick. So in this little demo file... My microphone comes in here. I don't have it routed right now. I can't or I'll mess up with what you're hearing. But this desktop microphone goes out to the room, comes in to the TCM1, and at the same time, this desk microphone is routed directly to you. So that's simulating the direct sound. That's what it would sound like if you were me hearing your own voice while you're talking. And then the TCM1 was coming back through this matrix mixer and it was coming in or coming back to you through this delay line on a separate feed from here. So that just basically allowed me to simulate this direct sound, which is me, and then the echo was coming through a delay line to represent the round trip delay coming through the phone system. Okay, um, not completely related, but where should feedback suppressors be after the mic input or before the amp channels? Uh, you may hate me for saying this, but uh, don't use them. I, I don't like feedback suppressors. I, I, I throw that out there because I really feel like if you've got a properly tuned system, then maybe you, you don't need a feedback suppressor. And I'm only saying that really because 
I see them get abused quite a bit. But no, feedback suppressors, if you don't know what they are, they're automatic ways of trying to detect feedback and turn it down. And most people do end up putting these um, before the amp. So basically on the output. So it's going to be part of your, your output EQ. Um, I don't know if there's much advantage to putting them on the individual inputs. I'm not really sure, and I haven't really talked to anybody that's made an argument one way or the other but most of the time I see feedback suppressors showing up with your output EQ going to the speakers in the room. And another one, in a voice lift application, do we not have to run a separate line from the mic inputs for dry mics like back in the old days? You don't have to. You absolutely can. And the question there is, if you want to use voice lift, can you bypass the AEC processing so your voice lift isn't going through all of this? And the answer is absolutely. So through voice lift, you can bring it through here, come up and go here to show up to your speaker in the room if you're doing voice lift in the room. So, um, but you don't have to. There is some additional latency through the AEC processing block. So you're gonna pick up some additional latency in most smaller systems, you don't need to worry about that. In a very large system, we definitely see a lot of people still pulling them off pre-AEC and using that for the voice lift. That way you can also use separate EQ for your voice lift system with those microphones and it's different than what's going out to the far end on the conferencing. Well, sometimes I find that you know less EQ is better on the far end. Uh, you want a cleaner signal, cut the highs, cut the lows, maybe do a little bit for intelligibility, but a lot of the EQ you would want to do to make it work for voice lift may actually make it sound worse to the people on the far end. So you can have two separate signals for that. And this, I'm going to take this last question here and answer that, and then we'll probably have to cut it off here. Actually, there's two more here, and then we'll have to go. Um, if there are still questions in there, I'll do everything I can to try to email them, email you answers. If you don't see an answer, just feel free to send me an email. Uh, but can you route, use a Dante stream as a reference? Absolutely. You can use Dante inputs coming back into the AC reference. And in fact, if you're using two Tessera DANs, then you need to route your reference to the other unit over Dante if you're linking them together. So you can do that. Um, not, you don't want to put a high pass filter. No, sorry, this last question is that I suggest putting a high pass filter before the AEC block, but you can't do that. That is correct. You don't want to put a high pass filter before the AEC block. The AEC block has a high pass filter. You want to use that high pass filter. So if you look at the, the block here, look at this channel processing block. Um, look at this external or this channel processing block, and you will see this advanced filters tab has the high pass filter. And this is built into the DSP. Oh, no problem. Okay, I'm going to have to jump off here. Um, I do have one more question that I'm going to have to answer offline. It's going to be, it looks like it might be fairly in depth to try to answer. So I do have to jump off of here. But thank you all very much for attending. And Shannon, I'll work on getting you an answer to that question. And if anybody has trouble downloading the PDF, please uh, shoot me an email and I will get that to you. It may not be letting you download that right now because the time technically has passed. So uh, we'll see what we can do to get that to you. Okay, so thank you all very much. I appreciate it. And we appreciate your feedback and comments. And please check out some of our other webinars that we have coming up.